Chapter One The Ceremians Gently soaring, basking under the sun, the two black bodies circled far above the shimmering atmospheric irregularity that was nearing completion on the planet's surface. As high as a small mountain, the iridescent transparency viewed from outside covered a smooth, hemispherical excavation in the planet's surface, two kilometers in diameter, except for an open pie cut, a not yet covered sector ten degrees wide. Looking into the open sector, structures, built on ground not excavated, paradoxically covered the entire inner area. The most striking of these structures was a tall, stepped pyramid centered under the dome. The black bodies floated, a wing spread apart, five times the arm spread of an Avery robot. These beings, the Avery robots, were even then streaming out of the incomplete sector, excavating the dome. The black bodies had learned the name Avery robot, but the name lacked meaning beyond its in intonation. The construction was slowed by our absence yesterday, Sacro, one black body said to the other, and I thank you for that. You needed the day off. Unfortunately, the effort was only slowed. It would have benefited by a complete interruption. You are a rascal, the other said, his red eyes gleaming like burning embers set deep in a black demonic body. I'll bet you arranged for an Avery to cut me loose during the tether last night. At least they'd learn not to blow us up. The black bodies appeared identical in form, a large white hook protruding from above deep-set, luminous red eyes, a lacy silver frond languidly waving at the other end, but bodies otherwise devoid of visible detail, except as flying wing silhouettes. Wrinkles in the skin, if any, and other possible lines of demarcation were lost in the soft blackness. "'You were cut loose,' the first said. "'Don't play innocence, Napo. "'Someone cut my tether last night, "'and by the time I drifted into sunrise, "'I was over Burnyup. "'Took me all day to get back. "'Have you ever tried to grow a new hook while underway? "'You do look a little beat, but then so am I. "'Trying to make sense of Wooler Nine is exhausting, "'and so far he's the best of the Averys. "'I learned very little today. "'We could both do with early.' early tether. I'll see you in the morning, Sacro. Wait up, you're not getting off that easy. But Sinapo was had already bald and was dropping. If not like a rock, still at an appreciable rate that put him out of earshot in a trice. Sacro sighed. A soft, gentle emission of pure oxygen with a faint trace of unreacted ammonia, but did not follow immediately. As Sinapo approached the surface of the planet, he began breaking, unfurling from his collar the tough, filmy hide of his reflector, letting it flap and rattle in his wake as it dragged at him like a sea anchor. As he neared the trees on the side of the domed transparency, away from the open sector, he sealed the gores of the thin, shiny reflector, sealing all but his head and side, leaving his hook and eyes protruding from the underside. With gentle bursts of compressed hydrogen, he began to inflate the reflector, dissipating his momentum and slowing his descent until he was barely drifting downward. Ten meters above the top of a tall conifer, he let go of his chitinesque hook, letting out the tether of a tough stringy, stringy hide until the hook was dangling below a sturdy limb. A final burst of hydrogen filled the reflector, erasing the last crease to leave a smooth, unblemished, mirror-like surface. The tether twanged taut, caught between the now buoyant silvery balloon and the hooked limb of the tree. Sinapo began the luxurious process of uncoiling his tense fibers, drifting into deep tether as he lay suspended within his own skin. His storage cells were not sated with a day's thermoelectric output from the sun's radiant heat as they normally would have been if the aliens had not been disturbing the atmosphere. But little of the radiation he had been exposed to that day had escaped 
the nearly perfect black body absorption of his other skin. That energy was all there, save for the small expenditure of intense thought and languid motion, and the large expenditure for electrolyzing water and compressing hydrogen and the unusual expenditure that day to converse, if it could be called that, with Willer Nine. Still, he had a sufficient reservoir of juice left in his cells. It would take little to get him through the night, just that amount needed to maintain body temperature, to make up for the minuscule amount of energy lost by radiation from his silvery hide. Sarko stayed afloat until Sinapo tethered. Then he bawled and dropped and tethered nearby so as to confront Sinapo the next morning, first thing. The Avery robots continued to stream from the open sector of the dome like a rat's abandoning an anthill. Dusk was coming on rapidly, but night would not hamper their operations. Wither Nine stood just outside the open sector. He had watched Sinapo and Sarko drop, but had not distinguished them from the rest of the black bodies which— a half hour later, began to fall from the sky like the gentle descent of a black snow that melted to bright raindrops as it neared the surface. Raindrops inversely and miraculously suspended above the trees in defiance of gravity. When the tiny amount of absorbed sunshine began to warm Snapto's reflector the next morning, he awoke and began to deflate. When his hook dangled free, he sucked in his tether and drifted to the ground, gently bouncing off the outer foliage of the tree. When he reached the ground, he unsealed the front seam of his reflector and pulled it around him like a bathrobe to preserve his body heat. On his two short legs, he waddled through the forest to a small brook. Sarko was already there, having breakfast and waiting for him. His hook was turned to the back in non-aggressive posture, which was a good sign. Still, he was having breakfast— could hardly expect anything else. Anger cannot abide alongside intense creature satisfactions. During the night, the feathery cold junction that protruded from Sinapo's rump had warmed, and the millions of hot junctions distributed throughout his lamp-like, lamp-black hide had cooled, so that both cold and hot junctions were now at the same medium temperature, and he had fasted throughout the night. Now as he backed up to the brook beside Sarko, he drew his reflector tight across his back to bunch it in front of him, and squatted to dip his cold junction into the icy water. He sighed contentedly as the fresh juice flowed into his storage cells. That fresh shot each morning was the best juice to be had all day. Neither spoke, which was the custom at breakfast, nor would they speak until they were again on the wing. Speaking, unless forced by exigencies such as the discussion of Fuller Nine, was a strict waste process, using the oxygen discarded from the electrolytic production of vital hydrogen. Electrolyzing, when their hydrogen sacs were full, merely to generate oxygen for speaking, was a luxury they seldom permitted themselves, a necessity only under the rarest of circumstances. That morning, however, Sinapo again planned to allow himself only an hour on the wing before he resumed his discussion with Fuller Nine. He timed it so that he could watch Maestrians at work, as he had for the past several days. He was depleting his cells to well below what he found comfortable. He went around continually hungry, but at least he would be generating hydrogen during the discussion, and not wasting juice as he would be otherwise. That was a small comfort as his store of vital energy dropped lower and lower. But Snappo felt the discussion was vital, not for what it had revealed so far, but for what it promised to reveal in the future. With breakfast over and the gores of their reflectors tightly rolled into black ruffled collars, they began the slow climb to charge altitude. Snappo, with Sarko following, slowly circled upward with languid but powerful strokes of his great wings. He kept the hemispherical iridescence centered below, so that when he finished his short change, he could drop rapidly to the open sector where he could see Wooler Nine standing vigil, right where he in, had been as Snapo dropped the tether the evening before. When they reached the comfortable altitude, Snapo slowed his flapping and then rolled onto his backside. 
a wing spread below Sacro, giving the other the dominant position, as was his right, as interrogator. That had been the status of their conversation the afternoon before, when Snappo had terminated it unilaterally. "'Now, Sarko, you were saying?' "'Forget that,' Sarko said. "'My tether was cut, and I was fuming yesterday evening, but it's no big deal. A new hook and a night's rest, and it's the same as forgotten.' Good, Sinapo thought. But it wasn't an Avery, it was my own burning breath which set you far into the sunrise. You wouldn't have stooped to such a childish trick if the situation hadn't warranted it. Did it? The thought that piece of unstatemanship lingered, unsettling his conscience. What is important, Sarko continued, is getting the weather back under control and stopping the god awful screeching of those tin aliens on hyperwave. The weather I'll have under control as soon as my people finish neutralizing that node below. I figure to have the compensator complete day after tomorrow. But the hyperwave is about to drive us all nuts. Have not those metal morons heard of continuous modulation? Of course, that's the way they arrived, Snappo said. But they just create modulation of hyperware, and our small discomfort with the crosstalk on our continuous channels is a minor problem. The real problem is your construction of the node compensator. It's a mistake, Sarko. You'll have to deactivate the aliens only temporarily. And if I'm right, as I am more and more sure I am, you'll have succeeded merely in deactivating a bunch of servants, and probably not for long. But you will have irritated their masters, sure as the gate Petairo is our guide. And the Cerebrons, what do they come up with? The Meustrians are at least taking action. In some contexts, the plural Mistrinian tribal name is better translated as Meostria, and the racial name Ceremion is better translated as Meoceron to reflect the Meostrian point of view. We had a caucus yesterday afternoon, Sinapo said. I'll agree I'm close to a breakthrough of Fuller 9. Whatever you do, don't close the compensator. You've already achieved better than 95% compensation. Meteorologically, you've already won. You got until sun peak day after tomorrow to achieve your breakthrough, Snappo. There was no point in arguing further. Snappo rolled out from under Sarko and drifted off to the left while climbing a temperature gradient to a slightly cooler stratum. That inverted gradient so early in the day was a measure of the meteorological disturbance. The residual effects of the alien creatures the completed dome would eliminate. After an hour of charge, he was still quite hungry, but nonetheless he bawled and dropped, wind whistling through the feathery frond of his cold junction, until he neared the top of the dome. Then he slowly spread his wings, breaking in a swoop that carried him on a complete circular inspection of the dome. He made one more pass around the dome, Lower now, looking for any sign of space-time instability. Why did he care? The dome could have leaped like Nimbar, and it wouldn't have mattered to him. It was a habit, though. A matter of professional pride. Pride in his race. Pride in Sarko's people and the technology they shared with the Cerebrons. As he rounded again toward the open sector, he braked to a slow, gentle glide and stirred hardly a wisp of dust came to rest beside the Avery robot who called himself Wooler Nine. He now had a fairly good idea what an Avery robot was. He had a modest grasp of the language called Galactic Standard, and even though it was certainly not standard in their part of the galaxy, they had become aware of it from the occasional bursts of discrete hyperwave that had reached them beginning centuries before. Translation of the language had been slow and incomplete lacking anything that might have served as a Rosetta Stone, but they had acquired a feeling for the language, in terms of the mathematical development of the species, and then, with Wooler Nine on hand, not quite an analogue of the Rosetta Stone, their fluency had progressed to the modest state Sinapo now claimed. "'Good morning, Wooler Nine, Sinapo said. The robot slowly swiveled his head until the eyes bore intently on Sinapo but otherwise he gave no sign of recognition. That did not distress Sinapo. In fact, he expected it. He now knew that the robot did not consider him a master, and so he was not worthy an attention unless he somehow violated 
the robot's basic programming, a prime directive and three guiding principles. The prime directive was to eradicate erect the monstrosities that had played such havoc with the weather by energy and particulate emissions, and which were now covered and almost neutralized by the compensator. The disturbance had been almost as great as that caused by the impact of a giant meteor a quarter century before. The function of the monstrosities was still not clear, other than being creations for the masters, with their benign weather brought under control eons before, the notion of shelter and buildings, if that had ever existed, had long since disappeared from the racial memory of the black bodies, lost in prehistory. <laughs> you properly informed your master of our interference and asked for assistance more than a hand of days ago, if we translated your message correctly. Each day I have asked if you have received further message instructions among the numerous messages that we have monitored in both directions. Your responses thus far have not been reassuring, but now we have reason to suspect that you have received some clarification of the situation, if we understand a message you received yesterday morning. I informed you of that message yesterday afternoon. I now ask again, have you received further instructions? Still, the robot did not answer. He swiveled his head back to watch the procession of robots and vehicles passing out of the dome, heading north across the plain bordered by the forest. We will complete the compensator, the dome, tomorrow, thwarting your prime directive, Sinapo added. That brought a response. Wooler Nine turned to face Sinapo. Miss Ariel Welsh will deal with you when she arrives this afternoon. Wooler Nine said, and swiveled back to watch the evacuation. There was no point in attempting further dialogue. Sinapo took off and headed for charge altitude in the Cerebron Caucus. Chapter 2 The Domed Pit Ariel Welsh, in her typical fashion, came in too fast on a trajectory that was accordingly too flat, and she skipped off the planet's atmosphere like a flat stone hitting the surface of a mill pond. Darn, she said, which seemed to understate the situation somewhat. She turned the controls over to Jacob Winterson, saying, Here, you do it. You should have asked me earlier, Miss Ariel, the robot said. You must save yourself for the negotiations with the aliens. But I do have a few suggestions with regard to your approach trajectories in general, which should benefit. Put a lid on it, Jake, Ariel said impatiently. Nonetheless, she watched the robot closely, and with a great deal of admiration, not only for his style of piloting, but for his superb appearance as well. She particularly liked to watch his biceps flex. She had acquired the robot only months before, the whim of a spoiled rich girl teasing a jealous boy boyfriend and rebelling against the mores of a bigoted Aurora society. Robots like R. Jacob Winterson were not popular on the planet of Aurora. Neither the men nor the women of Aurora wanted to be upstaged by the perfect comeliness and superhuman strength of a human form robot. Human form was the term their creator. Dr. Han Festolf had used to describe them, searching for a better term than humanoid, which hardly sufficed to describe Jacob. The Avery robots, like the ones she had once known as Wooler on the planet Robot City, could also be described as humanoid, but they were a far cry from Jacob. The simulation of a well-muscled body that was Jacob Winterson was a reflection of that era when bodybuilding was the vogue of a stagnant Auroran society. She watched him now as he plugged himself into the ship, a small two-man jumper with a cockpit just big enough for the two of them. She should have used the ship's computer to set up the proper approach trajectory, just as she was about to do, instead of coming in cowboy fashion, hands-on. She watched the thick muscles at work in his bull-like neck, watching the flexing of biceps the size of piano legs, corded by thick veins reaching across his powerful forearms. She had prevailed upon the ancient Vastila Fastolf, the estranged daughter of the famed Dr. Hahn, to, 
the delve deep into the catacombs below Aurora's Robotics Institute, and bring out Jacob from among the thirteen humiforms left over from the aborted campaign to sell them to a recalcitrant Auroran public. She had never seen Jacob naked, though Derek didn't know that. Vassil had brought him up from the depths of fully clothed, and then he seemed so real, so alive in the human sense, that Ariel had never explored beneath the surface of the ample wardrobe she had provided him. It seemed too much an invasion of privacy. The idea appealed to her, she had to admit, but not so strongly as to overcome her loyalty to Derek. In her mind, her teasing was not a form of disloyalty, no matter how miserable it made Derek. Like the myriads of young women who had preceded her, she had no idea how miserable it really made him, or she wouldn't have teased him. On their third orbit, Jacob located their destination. The beleaguered robot city, Wooler Nine, had described by radio after they had jumped into the system. Derek was apparently not in the city at the time. Earlier, Ariel had counted on hearing Derek's voice. Their destination was the second largest iridescent domed pit they had seen on the planet, and the only one with a pie cut of city buildings that extended to the center of the shimmering pit. Jacob laid in a trajectory that would bring them through the atmosphere to a landing on the open plain half a kilometer north of the dome and near the path of evacuation of the Avery robots. And then, with the help of the jumper's computer, he executed the maneuver flawlessly. They disembark less than fifty meters from the line of evacuation and commandeered a large courier robot carrying two packages. Return to the city, Ariel said as she sat down on one of the packages and motioned Jacob to sit down on the other. She would have liked to sit, have said, take me to Wooler, but the non posturonic brain of the courier would not have been capable of interpreting and executing that command. As they neared the open sector of the dome, towering a kilometer above them, Ariel said, Can you raise Wooler on the radio, Jacob? I have, Miss Ariel, Jacob replied. He is standing over to the right of the opening in the dome. The robot pointed and said, There, by that large open lorry. Up close, the paradoxical nature of the huge iridescent bubble became more dramatic as Ariel looked down through the flickering wall of the dome, into the pit that seemed to underlie a city built on solid ground. Looking through the wall and the opening at the same time, the city seemed to float above the evacuation. It left her feeling decidedly uneasy. "'Take us to Wooler,' she said to the courier. They disembarked at the lorry and walked up to Wooler Nine, an imposing gold machine standing at the front of the lorry and facing the stream of evacuating robots. "'I am Ariel Welsh,' she said. "'I know,' said Wooler Nine. "'What is going on here?' Ariel asked. We are moving the necessary material for construction of a second compass tower and city on the other side of the plain, five kilometers away. Why? This dome will soon be closed by the aliens, blocking all traffic into and out of the city. Why? That is not clear. Where is Derek Avery? I do not know, since he is not on this planet. Ariel took a moment to absorb that. When did he leave? He has never been here, the golden robot replied. Now she felt slightly ill. She had misunderstood that weak relay from the central computer, which led her to believe Derek would be here. She had to keep talk, talking, or scream. She had thought she would see him so soon. Are all the supervisors here ninth generation? she asked. No, I am the only ninth. All others are eighth generation. How did that come about? Willer One sacrificed himself to rescue you from the site of Robot City's compass tower during a life threatening thunderstorm, Miss Welsh. The Burundi's feather Dr. Avery had exposed her to, a mnemonic plague, so called, had robbed her of the links to her memory. The memory had still been there. But she had lost the connections to it. 
There I could help restore those links by providing clues from their mutual experiences. That particular experience involving Willard One must have been exceptionally potent, for now her mind orchestrated that clue into an unnerving symphony of emotion as the experience condensed into consciousness. The guilt of causing the termination of that magnificent golden robot laid on top of her misunderstanding of the relayed message from this planet left her momentarily faint. She swallowed hard to regain her composure, and then said, brusquely, "'What is the nature of the drone? Why not simply destroy it?' "'A simple demonstration will suffice to answer your question, Miss Welsh,' Willer Nine replied. He unclipped a meter-long chrome-plated crowbar from the side of the lorry, and started walking toward the edge that bordered the right side of the opening in the gl dome's glimmer. Ariel and Jacob followed him, and as Ariel approached the interior of the dome, getting a little ahead of Volar Nine in her impetuous fashion, she could see up close the soft blackness of the lining, a blackness that demarcated the end of the ground and the beginning of what seemed open space. Looking down at it sent her into a dizzying, subjective vertigo. She seemed to spin it in that black space as it drew her down, sucking at her mind. "'Under no circumstances come closer than half a meter, Miss Welsh,' Willer Nine said as he casually moved his arm in front of her. With that warning she seemed to come back to her senses, and she moved back out so that she was facing the edge from a distance of a few meters.' Her head cleared, and from that position she could now see along both the inside and outside walls. Willer Nine then approached the edge of the wall to almost that half-meter limit himself. He stopped then, facing the inner wall, and said, "'And don't become confused. The wall may seem deceptively far away.' He took a baseball batter stance then, and with a lusty swing that brought the crowbar around in a horizontal arc perpendicular to the wall— he struck the edge of the dome with the middle of the crowbar. Without a sound, the edge of the dome, like the edge of a super-sharp tool, cut the crowbar neatly in half. The far end of the crowbar sailed off. The near end stayed firmly in Wooler Nine's hands as he completed his swing. Then he casually tossed the remnant toward the inside wall. Ariel's eyes had followed n the flight of the far end of the crowbar, until it hit the ground and stopped skipping. She looked back just as Willer Nine tossed the piece left in his hand toward the interior blackness. That piece seemed to have curved in toward the blackness a fraction of the distance it would have traveled if he had tossed it straight up in the air with the same force, and then it came shooting back out on a parabolic course, obviously calculated to hit no one. It landed behind him at a distance equal equal to the distance it would have traveled in front of him if the wall had not been there. Now, a second demonstration will point up and clarify the dome's external characteristics. He picked up the half-crowbar that had just sailed back out of the blackness, walked over, tossed it into the lorry, and then unclipped two sections of the tubular pole from the side of the vehicle. When he fitted the two sections together, he had a pole about five meters long. From a locker he took a large piece of white cloth that he followed, unfolded and tied to the pole to form a square flag, a little less than four meters on the side. With the flagpole in hand, he walked along the outside of the dome until he was three or four meters from the edge of the opening. Ariel followed him. They were walking along the edge of a deep, shimmering, hemispherical pit two kilometers across and a kilometer deep. From that viewpoint, there was no evidence of the city that they knew existed inside the shimmer. Under no circumstances let any part of your body touch or project into the transparent dome, Willer Nine said. That part of you would go through and never be the same again. Now observe the flag. He pushed the flag through the drome's glimmer. It seemed to disappear. Perhaps it appears to be gone, he said, waving the pole. But look carefully at the far side of the pit. At first, Ariel could see nothing unusual on the other side, but after a moment, after looking more carefully, she finally saw a tiny white flag waving, far away, 
two kilometers away on the other side of the pit. Roller 9 laid down the pole so that it still projected into the dome. It did not lie flat on the ground. The near end hung suspended, slanting into the dome at the ground. The tiny flag on the other side of the pit disappeared into the grass. Two further observations, for which we'll use the lorry. He left the pole projecting into the dome, retrieved the other half of the crowbar from the deep grass, tossed it into the lorry beside the first half, and stepped in to stand at the rope driver's station. Ariel took a seat immediately behind the golden robot, and Jacob stepped up to stand beside Roller 9, who immediately took off down the west side of the dome, staying well away from the edge of the pit. They were almost halfway around the dome before Roller 9 spoke again. We should be coming to it now, he said, and then Ariel saw the white flag lying in the grass with the pole sticking out of the dome a few centimeters above the ground. Roller 9 stopped the lorry. You do not need to get out. He stepped down from the lorry, picked up the pole carefully as though it were a fragile memento, walked back and offered the flag end to Ariel. Take a hold of the end, he said. When she did, he moved his end as though to bend it in her grip, and it snapped in two. Passing through the dome distorts the crystal structure, setting up fault lines with very little strength. Now, one last observation, this time inside the dome. He drove back the way they had come and then drove through the opening, close to the right side. The traffic pouring out of the dome gave way smoothly, shifting to its right to accommodate the lorry, as though a computer were directing all the traffic, which it was, of course, the central city computer. We'll take the perimeter route to avoid bucking the traffic coming down Main Street. Willer Nine said, even though it will be a little longer this way, half pi, half pi times longer. Willer Nine drove rapidly to a point halfway around the perimeter of the dome. He stopped on the same wide street, Main Street, which approached the dome, <clears throat> which approached the dome as close as any. Ariel looked back down the street and saw the compass tower framed in the opening of the dome. Wooler Nine led them now to the dome wall opposite the end of the street, and handed Ariel a pair of binoculars as he pointed to a bright, small object in the soft darkness of the inner wall. Ariel put the binoculars to her eyes, and with the focus wheel at the infinite setting, she could just barely make out a shape that had the appearance of a small two-man flyer headed toward them with its landing lights on. This is the final test of the drone, which we began earlier this afternoon, Willer Nine said. Right now, the flyer is held by the gravity of the black concavity at a virtual distance of four kilometers. It is headed toward us, but held motionless by the black concavity with the flyer's impulse engines throttled back to 75% capacity, equivalent to an acceleration of 10 Gs. We plan to bring it in now. Its fuel is almost depleted. Ariel had a hard time taking the binoculars away from her eyes. She turned to hand them to Jacob. Here, I want you to record this, she said. I want you as a witness. Derek's not apt to believe any of this. Thank you, Miss Ariel, Jacob said. But with my fifty-power binocular vision, I have already recorded the unusual operation of this flyer. Ariel was tired. It had been a long day already. Altogether too much for one day. Too much sensory stimulation, too many strange ideas, too much emotion. She missed Derek and felt inadequate to the challenge presented by this alien world. Unless you have further exhibits and demonstrations, Wooler, Ariel said, I would like to shower and freshen up. Later, after some dinner, you can give me a detailed report. I have just ordered in the flyer, Miss Welsh, Buller Nine said. We shall now proceed immediately to your apartment. As they drove down the broad street toward the compass tower, the faint sound of the flyer grew louder. 
Ariel turned to watch its lights growing brighter now in the soft darkness surrounding the city. She had a hard time taking in everything she had seen in the short time she had known Willernine. Then she could see the flyer growing larger with her naked eye, until it came hurtling out of the wall and screamed by overhead, spiraling up over the compass tower and out the opening in the dome. And thus ends the first part. This is very, very long. Um, yeah. <laughs> So when I put down before, and I said this was going to be a 15-part stuff, it's actually going to be 16 parts now, because some of those chapters are long enough to merit being its own part. So it's going to be a bit longer, and the size distribution of chapters is very interesting. Because a bunch of the chapter, the first few chapters are really, really long, and then the further you get in the book, the shorter the chapters get. So, some like parts, well, pretty much, yeah, like part fourteen is going to be three different chapters, and so is part nine. I was going to have part three be also a three-chapter part, but. Since chapter 30 was also super short, it split up into part 15 and 16. So, yeah. No, it's, uh, quite a bit. I'm flipping through, and it doesn't really seem like, uh, Derek's really in this book too much. Like, I'm... Yeah, I'm flipping through. There's some stuff about Derek in chapter 16. There might be some earlier than that. I'm not flipping through this book very well. Anyway, that is it for this first part. There's going to be a couple others that are going to be probably as long as this. I haven't recorded a chapter this long in ages. There's a reason why... I've been doing like one chapter apart in the past until I've started Robots and Aliens. Anyway, that's all and I hope you ha are all having an enjoyable day this far. Bye!